All right, let's start. So today we have Brian Cantrell. He's a co-founder and CTO of Euler, the company which builds a rec scale computer for the post-cloud era. Previously, he worked at Sun and later Oracle. Brian is one of the main authors of DTrace, a tool for real-time tracing and diagnosis. He also uh, was a CTO of Joint, one of the cloud computing pioneer firms. Well, Brian, welcome. I'm really excited to have you today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's exciting to be here. Cool. Well, Brian, you are a, you know you are a veteran in the computing industry. You have worked on many different layers of the hardware and software stack, uh, and you know, and I'm sure we can learn a lot from you. And 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 you know, since for you know, since, since the main topic for today is software performance, let's actually start with like what is your relationship with software performance? <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, actually, my first when I first came out to work for Sun, it was actually in the Solaris Performance Group, um, which at the time felt like a bit of an oxymoron, honestly. Uh, Solaris did not necessarily have a, a good reputation for performance. And, you know, cause it, it's funny because I think performance is important to me. One thing I just know about myself is that correctness is more important to me than performance. So... I. I and that's something I kind of have learned over the years because, I mean, there are people that will that, that, that believe in performance at the cost of, of potential correctness. Um, and, I, you know, I'm not one of them. I, I, for me, software really needs to be correct first and then perform second. Um, so that's I, and I guess ultimately performance has a bit of a subservient relationship to correctness in that regard. But I also believe that it's a false dichotomy and that we can, we very often obviously can make software that is uh, correct and very highly performing. I think that the, for me also, in terms of looking at systems performance, I mean, the, th the thing that is so transfixing about software is it's this incredibly complicated mathematical machine. It's this this thing that we can't actually see, we can't put our hands on. Um, and I think much of my career, especially with respect to performance, has been understanding what the software is doing. And when you understand what the software is doing, you often are able to step back from the system and get away from the lowest level implementation details, which still can be extremely important. But when you take a step back, you can actually find that like, oh my God, it's actually like, why is this Perl script executing 5,000 times a second? Or, what, you know, why are we, you know, as, as one of our former colleagues, Bart Spalders, phrased it, um, the, the best optimization is eliminating the work that you didn't need to do at all. Um, it's not making work faster. It's the elimination of work completely. And in order, and I think we're still, I mean, frankly, it feels like we're still in our infancy to really be able to get that high level view of what a system is doing and understand its gross inefficiencies. And in terms of where I think things are going, I, I believe, and I, I mean, I have believed for the last, you know, 25, 30 years, but, but now I be, this belief is coming in a much sharper focus that I will live long enough in my career to have power be an important part of the equation, even for server-side computing. So um, I think we're gonna care about power. I think we need to care about power. I think we've been grossly inefficient with respect to power. Um, we've got a lot of these, you know, we've kind of, we've got these scale out architectures now, which are great in so many ways, but they're often not very power efficient. Um, I remember um, talking to the then CTO of Zynga describing Zynga, RIP, um, but describing um, a name that they had deployed. They had it on 6,000 servers. This is a PHP game on 6,000 physical servers. And I remember thinking, good God, what is the draw of that? You know, how much, how much CO2 are you emitting from, you know, Mafia Wars or whatever? And thinking, like, that, that cannot be maximally efficient. I just refuse to believe it. Like there's got to be some gross inefficiencies in that architecture. And I think we are still not at the point where we are able to find those gross inefficiencies uh, quickly. And we're definitely not at the point where we're able to actually connect that to, to kilowatt hours. Um, that is not where we are right now. Um, I believe that we will need to be there um, in the next two and three decades, uh, as, as I think more people realize that our resources are finite and that we need to be much, much smarter about how we use those finite resources. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So, so you talk about you know uh, eliminating unnecessary work, and and and, and I, I agree that's that's key. You know, and for, let's uh, so for the last few decades we had this you know healthy Moore's law, right? Software vendors were relaxed. They knew that you know they will get performance boost next year, so they didn't have incentives to go and optimize their code. So, do you think that this situation is now changed, or not yet? The situation has changed. I, you know, for its worth, and I know that this is a I, obviously Moore's law had a terrific bounty. I never knew anyone in software who was just like, "Hey, you know what? We get to chill out and wait for the next generation of CPUs to, to make it." It was never that explicit. It was always much more explicit than that. It was always um, much more about, um, "Hey, let's it, let's actually use a this language or environment that we know is much less resource efficient." But we don't have to be as good about those resource inefficiencies, and not be, no one making the direct connection to Moore's law. But I mean, if you look at things like honestly, like DRAM utilization, right? We haven't really cared about DRAM utilization, which is much, is a, as much a reflection that transistor density, DRAM density, it's, it has been on its own power law effectively. Um, so I, I do think that we have been. I, I, well, I think it's a myth that software engineers are just kind of like allowed for Moore's law to do their job for them. I think it is also true that these that all these various power laws around storage density, transistor density, DRAM density have uh, have allowed us to um, solve the problem differently. And in general, we have solved them around making software uh, accessible, people, making it quick to write software. And that all makes sense for software that's brand new. But once you have software that has kind of sedimented into uh, – we, we agree that, like, actually, we don't need to – it's not that we need to write this. We know that this thing exists, that it's important. And now you begin to ask, well, why is it actually in this inefficient language? You know, I had a – I had a Cassandra performance nightmare that was ruining to and ended up being a misconfiguration issue, which itself is its own interesting. But in the process of that, we were eliminating various causes of uh, the, the poor Cassandra performance, and one of them was garbage collection. And this thing is like having 160 millisecond GC pauses, which to me is like, well, there's your problem. <laughs> You've got a database that has decided to go take a 160 millisecond cigarette break. Like that's your problem. Um, but the we were talking to you know, we had a, engaged a, a consultant who deals with a lot of Cassandra performance, and he was like, "Yeah, it's not so bad actually. Like as a GC pause, like I've seen a lot worse." And you're thinking like, "Wait, what?" And I just remember, and he was, and I when I was kind of phrasing it to him like, that, "That's insane that we, that we kind of allow." that kind of pause in work from a database. Like a, a database lives to work. It works 24-7, 365, or should anyway. And when we, we develop a database in a language that is has enshrined garbage collection, we have emphasized the development of that database over the operation of that database. And that, that to me is a mistake when we agree that the abstraction is one that's valuable. Like once we know that the abstraction is right, uh, go rewrite it, please. And I this guy's like, yeah, I know, man. Whoever thought of writing a database in a GC language, am I right? And I'm like, wait, wait a minute, aren't you? You're the one dedicating your career to debugging these kinds of problems. But um, so I, I, I do think that that's an example where it's like, the, you know, was Cassandra written in Java because of Moore's law? No. Um, it was written in Java because it was faster, people were more comfortable with it, it made sense. Um, also because it was like honestly, and I think this is true for a lot of software, somewhat speculative at the time, right? I mean the folks, um, you know, the, 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 the person who, who uh, ran Cassandra development or kind of initiated that development inside of Facebook – um, is actually someone I, I've known, and, and he has said that like if I had actually known that that was going to get any kind of traction, we would have done it differently from the start. Um, but this is true for a lot of software. A lot of software, you actually don't know if it's going to have traction before you write it. You don't know if the abstractions are right. And there's this really, uh, there's this kind of this inflection period where you go from uh, you want to get the abstractions right and you need to be able to quickly iterate to hey, the abstraction is right, and now this thing I really care about all of its operational attributes. And historically, there's been no real, and this is where we end up in kind of the language problem, there's been no real language that has really been able to, I think, straddle both of those use cases, where you have a, 
This allows you to develop software quickly, but it's also designed to, to create a quick and, and operationally efficient artifact, um, which has been, I mean, obviously this is the, the lead up to, for those of you playing the, the Sunday morning spaces can't show you and drinker game. This is obviously the lead up to Rust, which I think is an extremely big deal, because I think Rust does allow you to saddle that that divide serve both of those use cases. Right. So what you said make, makes completely you know com complete sense to me. And so and I have a follow up question. So, like uh, you know, I consider myself a performance engineer, right? So I spend my time optimizing code written by other people. So <laughs> yeah. so 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 how 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 relevant do you think performance engineering is today? How relevant you know is my job today? And 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 the reason I'm asking is not that I'm worrying about my job. <laughs> I'm 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 okay, right? But but rather I wanted to understand the reason why there are not many performance engineers out there. Is it because the software is already quite optimal and nothing to worry about performance wise? Or performance engineering is just too hard, like you know, you need to know all the like how the hardware works, all those, you know, like metrics and tools. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, I think it's a pretty deep question, actually. Um, and I think it, it, I mean, first of all, I think it's extremely important, obviously, just to give you the confidence that it's, <laughs> your life's calling is one that is, that is, that is valuable. I think it is extremely hard. And I think it's hard because we have designed, for all of computing, we design these horizontal layers of abstraction to, it, to allow us to develop things quickly and to use the abstractions beneath us. And that's, those aren't the wrong decisions necessarily, but when the artifact either doesn't perform or doesn't work, uh, especially if it doesn't perform in production or doesn't work in production, all of those horizontal layers of abstraction are now against us. And now you need to actually take this vertical slice through the system. And that vertical slice is really hard. And especially, it, it's especially hard you have, as we kind of sediment this, this, these horizontal abstractions and the, the thinking around, people don't understand necessarily what they're building on. And we don't necessarily want them to, right? Like this is like, th th this is where we get into this real paradox where in order for those abstractions to be effective, we actually want to isolate people and insulate people from what's beneath them. But then when the whole thing either doesn't perform well or doesn't work, we kind of ask it like, hey, wait a minute, how could you have done something so negligent? You know, how could you possibly be, why are you, you know, opening this file instead of statting it? Or why, you know, all of these things that you find that are, it feels like kind of gross malpractice. But then you realize, well, maybe it's because we have actually delivered this abstraction to you so convincing that you think it is free. And it, so I think that's the challenge our ability to, to cut vertically through the system. And again, I think that I, I view performance engineering as very much a debugging exercise. To me, you can take your exact same question and phrase it just in terms of, of correctness debugging. Like, mm -hmm. why are there so relatively few people that are able to debug a system in production. And I, I, I've got the same for many years. I was like, you know, I have definitely spent more time debugging other people's code than I feel like writing my own, but I've written my own code. It's to debug their code. Like, the, you know, the most important code I've written in my life is actually to help me debug someone else's code. And so I'm like, is there like a scoreboard of like bugs created versus bugs debugged? And like, I feel like for there, there must be people that are just like writing software and never debugging it in order for the universe to balance out, I think. I don't know. Anyway. Right. But okay, so so how good do you think modern software is in terms of performance? And, 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 you know, and, and do we even need faster software and hardware? Like, uh, general purpose software and hardware, right? Um, for sure. Yeah, I mean, we for sure, we... Because it, it, it's not about performance, it's about efficiency. Um, we, you, we always should be seeking to do more with less. And the... You know, hardware has created a lot more for us, and that's great. That means that we can do, like, we should be able to do even more work. We shouldn't be seeking to do the same amount of work with with new and better hardware. We should be seeking to do uh, even more work. Um, so, yeah, for sure, it, it, it definitely matters. Um, and that efficiency, I think, will increasingly, over time, we've already seen this with the end of Denard scaling, um, 
in the, the kind of the mid two thousands. Um, and I, I think that we absolutely will. I mean, like kind of you know, interesting question. It, to what degree does the end of Denard scaling? Uh, correlate to the rise of Rust. Like, I don't necessarily think that they're unrelated um, as people realize that, like, actually you can't just go to an arbitrarily uh, interpreted environment and assume that the you'll, as we were saying earlier, the, assume if implicitly that you'll be bailed out by clock scaling, which was true for, for you know, a couple of decades in there, but has been not true for a long time. Um, and I think that, you know, it, it looking looking towards the future, we are going to need to do, we're going to need to be smarter about the way we use resources. That is a, this is true of all of humanity. Um, and right now, I think from a software perspective, it looks a lot like the gas guzzlers from the 70s, you know, where we had cars that were that were woefully fuel inefficient because it just didn't matter. And I think that the, you know, it's, a, it's an energy shock. We'll do it to software, is doing it to software. I think it's, it is the decline of, uh, or the, the gradual ending of Moore's law and of a need to, to rethink our software's relationship with, with the hardware underneath it. Right, right, yeah, 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 yeah. I agree. Um, so, Brian, there was a good talk uh, by one of your former colleagues uh, joined uh, by Brandon Gregg. It, it, it actually like just was a few months ago, where he tried to predict some of the future trends in the computing world. Did you have a chance to watch it? Maybe uh, you know, I didn't watch the talk. I think I saw his. Uh, I think I saw his summary of it. I can go dig it up now. I think, I, if I recall, I, when I saw his summary of it, it all seemed no. pretty level-headed. Yeah. No. No worries. So, 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 you know, I, uh, he he actually said many things, but uh, I just want to to you know to 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 bring up two uh, points that he made. So first, he said that uh, multi-socket systems may disappear in the future because the socket is big enough. I agree with that. Al yeah, already, totally. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. I think multi-socket is is, and I mean. I'm talking my book because we are all the so in the oxide rack we've got 32 sleds that um, all th those 32 sleds are all single socket. I, I think that um, I, I, for multi sockets does not in order for multi socket to make sense, you need to have a single application that is going to span both sockets. And when we're talking like AMD sockets, you're talking about a lot of threads. Um, and those things need to, you, you need to have an application that is going to span both of those sockets and need to share a single memory. And it's, it's kind of hard to come up with those use cases. I mean, I'm not saying that they, they don't exist, but um, no, so I think Brendan is right. I think that the, uh, the, single, the single socket, the, the only reason why you will not, you will continue to see dual socket systems, I think, um, is if you've got kind of power or real estate, um, if you've got thermal to kind of spare, and you may want to use that on a second socket. Uh, in other words, it is like you are having a second socket in there, but it is really logically, it is a second one socket system. So yes, I, I, I do agree with that. Mm -hmm. And the second point he made is that um, uh, we will reach the limit of the number of cores by 2030, uh, and this limit will be 1,000 cores. So here is actually where the universal scalability law comes into play, right? So, so things like interconnect and cache coherency may become a bottleneck. Uh, do you have thoughts on that? Um, I really hard to speculate on the number of cores. Um, the I, it's that definitely is is requiring more speculation about how we exactly land, where we land from a process perspective. Um, and then how that e is spent. But I think that we, uh, we will hit density limits for sure. We are hitting density limits. Um, we are, I, I agree with what Brendan is saying directionally, na namely that we are not yet at that density limit, but that we're getting close and that density limit is within sight. Um, and it also as a density limit as an economic limit too. I mean, I think that you, we will probably increasingly differentiate between the ability to go higher and where that makes pragmatic sense. And the ability to go density will look more like supercomputing kind of workloads, which historically have been pretty limited in their audience. Um, so I, 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 I definitely, I do agree with that. Um, I think as you look at the, the interconnect, I mean, I think that, you know, the, 
uh, the network is the computer still. <laughs> so like the, uh, the network is the computer being Sun's tagline uh, later absconded with um, by Cloudflare because apparently Oracle didn't bother to re-up the trademark, a little bit gross. Um, but the, um, I, I still believe that the network is the computer and that we, that is the interconnect that becomes essential. Um, and, you know, we've got a lot of work to do still on that, on that interconnect. Um, and I think that we are, um, you know, not yet at the limits there, certainly. Um, but I think we also have a, a lot to do to make that uh, pragmatic and not just fast, but there's a lot of work that can be done to deliver uh, more effective throughput and better effective latency to applications while still delivering all the other things the network needs to deliver around security and manageability and so on. So yeah, I, I do agree that we're, you know, single socket systems are the future and we are hitting the limits of, uh, of, of that core count. And so that does bring you down some pretty natural roads around what that interconnect is gonna, gonna have to look like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we have a request uh, from one of from from the audience, uh, faster clock. Uh, Hi, wanted uh, to say, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Stephen Crosshair. Brian, I just want to say it's a pleasure to get to speak with you. I've been a long time uh, follower and reviewing the Contrillions. Anyway, um, <laughs> I, had a, I had a question regarding uh, software to hardware. Um, I'm a software developer myself, been in it 20 years, and one of the things I always thought in the beginning and I'm coming back to now is that software really is meant to eventually become hardware. We have two different uh, end games for that, really. It's FPGA or ASIC are the two ends of that spectrum. Uh, do you do you agree with that, or what path would you see towards that? I, I totally agree with it. Um, I, I totally agree with it. I, I think I would have agreed with that a little more abstractly uh, before oxide, um, I think I would have I would have not disagreed with it before oxide, but I now believe in it emphatically. Um, and I think that um, I mean now it it doesn't. I think that uh, FPGAs have soft logic, programmable logic. I think I'm in the trouble a little bit when they've oversold themselves and oversold the potential there. Um, we soft logic is going to be extremely important. It doesn't allow us to kind of. Uh, get out from underneath the physical limits of transistor density. But I do think it's going to be, it is really important. I think the absolute most important thing that has to come to both to, to soft logic, to, uh, and uh, certainly to, to CAD and PC, to PCB design and layout, we've got to get open source systems all the way down. So, um, you know, huge kudos to, uh, to Claire Wolf, who uh, she reverse engineered the Lattice bitstream format and has allowed complete open source tooling um, to actually program ICE-40 FPGAs, the, 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 the Lattice FPGAs. That, to me, is an essential step. Like, we can't get to where soft logic needs to go in with proprietary software. Um, the proprietary software here, I mean, it's actually, it's, it, it's kind of helpful. And, you know, you've been, you, you sounds like, you know, you and I are of similar vintage. So I feel like you and I remember what proprietary software was like, but like the, the idea, you know, for, you know, these kids today, they, they don't know what it's like to have a proprietary compiler, you know, where you have, <laughs> which is, a, right, you remember that, right? It's a terrible, terrible experience. Um, and, you know, it, it is not an accident at all that the very first that open source meaningfully laid waste to was proprietary compiler market because it is just devastating to have a proprietary compiler because you have, you, you, for all of the reasons that proprietary software sucks, right? Because you now have been, you've given your software vendor monopoly power over you and whether explicitly, in I guess case, but implicitly, more oftenly, uh, they act as a monopolist does and they give you a shitty product. And that's where we are right now with EDA. EDA is, is I mean, it, this is changing, but not changing fast enough. But EDA is locked in this proprietary world, and where, and you know, it's not enough to make Vivado or whatever freely downloadable for the Xilinx suite. It's like we actually need to get to a completely open ecosystem 
open Bitstreams, open EDA, KiCad is clutch, uh, the, 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 the Yosis is clutch, Next PNR is clutch. Like we need all of this stuff and we need to add it all together to get a totally open stack. And that will change. I, I mean, and we know, we've seen this happen. We've seen this happen in these other domains. Uh, but honestly, like the software that does place and route is, uh, I mean, the level of sophistication is super high for that software. EDA software is extremely yeah. sophisticated. And, but I, I am totally with you that we, and the, uh, the line between software and hardware has never been blurrier and it's about to get way more blurry in a very exciting way. And I do think that especially for, um, for software that is latency sensitive, performance sensitive, or other domains in which you want to be able to control the hardware, and there are actually many of them, um, it's going to yeah. become more important for people to be conversant in that entire stack. But we have to get to an open ecosystem to do it. We cannot do it on a closed ecosystem. It is, I, and I think yeah. that, that, you know, when, because I think FPGAs over the years, you know, there have been a couple of big pushes where it's like, this is going to kind of change everything. And it's like, it's not going to change anything as long as it's proprietary. It has to be made open. I don't know if you agree with that or not. But I agree. But what is the closest that you would say, and I ask this for the crowd, what's the closest thing that you would say that we have right now for a software to hardware compiler? And that's my last question. Thank you. Yeah, the closest thing that I hold on my, my headset, I, I just I, appropriately the firmware on my headset just rebooted. So I think at the you know, <laughs> um, you know, proprietary software knows it. That's what I'm talking. Um, so um, the so sorry, you were asking about what is our our best example of that of that kind of that blurry software hardware. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think that you've got to look at the, the, again, the reverse engineering of the, of the ICE 40 bit stream uh, and of the other lattice bit streams and the development of, of Yosis. That is where you, um, the open sourcing of BlueSpec. I have, um, BlueSpec is a really interesting HDL that was proprietary software for many years. Um, thank you, Google, for forcing them to open source it. Um, it's kind of the best open source project you've never heard about. Um, and you can see, you know, these are these like little tiny routes and it really does remind me of what open source looked like in like the mid nineties where, where, you know, open source in the mid nineties was, it was kind of hobbyist. It was, I mean, yes, people were starting to use GCC, but it was pretty far afield and you, you kind of had to be a, in the domain to really appreciate that there is actually a real potential for for pretty deep change here, um, and I, that's how I'm I, I view it today. And I think the, the next couple of years are going to be really interesting. I think that uh, KiCad is about to get uh, really interesting. Um, so we've been using uh, at for our boards at Oxide, we've been using KiCad for our proto boards, but have not really been able to use it for our bigger boards i think that's going to change in the next two years three years uh they've got a a, a you know in keycad six that i think is really going to kind of change the the uh the conversation around keycad um in part because keycad is getting i mean just what we've seen before keycad is getting better and the proprietary software is staying shitty so the, the, the target's not moving um we, and it will catch up um i think that we uh, and again, blue spec, uh, when what you're watching, you know, look at, keep an eye on what's happening with Lattice. I, unfortunately, I don't think, what, what, now on the flip side of it, and for, like, for, those are all reasons for optimism. Reasons for pessimism are that, that Xilinx and Altera are pretty tied up in, I think, uh, this for a fact, but I think it's a pretty reasonable assumption that they have assumed that they themselves would be proprietary for their entire lifetime. And one of the things we appreciated at Sun is that when you are, you assume that you're going to be proprietary, when being open is not even part of the consideration, you have all of these covenants and agreements that really prevent you from opening it up. So it would not surprise me if Altera and Xilinx really can't become open um, the, you know, they, I think they could facilitate the openness of their bitstream, but I think that the, a lot of their tooling is going to probably, or wouldn't surprise me if that needs to remain, um, remain proprietary. Needless to say, if I were Pat Gelsinger, I think one of the greatest properties that, that Gelsinger has that he is actually 
uh, not using properly is Altera. Um, I, if I were Altera, um, and I've tried to make this argument to Lattice with like limited success with Lattice. Lattice is, because Lattice did not uh, ask for their bitstream to be reverse engineered. They kind of just uh, didn't litigate against it. <laughs> so uh, even, what's that? Um, so even now, Lattice is kind of a, a bit, doesn't really know how to deal with it. And of course, our attitude in talking to Lattice is like, this is the best thing that's ever happened to Lattice. It's like, you actually have an opportunity to be the first truly open FPGA. And they kind of know this. Um, I also feel that they've got like God's own open source revenue model. It's like, you sell FPGAs, you knuckleheads. You don't, you yeah, sell the hardware, obvious. you don't sell the software, <laughs> right? Uh, so you should be encouraging this. Like if I am Lattice, like you be, and uh, th these technologists, just like in open source and kind of the early and mid nineties, the technologists like Claire Wolf and the people kind of in this ecosystem are like, they don't require much encouragement. You know, these are really great technologists that, you know, you can, you know, th this is like, it's old school and that like, boy, you could just make some hard and, you know, maybe, yeah. you know, I, you know, a couple thousand bucks for some, some pizza busts or whatever, beer busts or whatever, like good things will happen. This is really, really easy, yeah, that, but they don't quite get it. Part, part of the, I think part of the problem there is that if, at least from a business perspective, I agree with you 100%. I think what business folks see, um, I mean, what's the biggest example uh, market-wise of a company going uh, open source and it just coming back to bite them in the ass, of course, is Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft doesn't know what to do, and, and it's just making them look bad. And while you're absolutely right with the FPGAs, I think the old world business uh, mindset is locking them there. And whenever folks like you speak to them and say, hey, no, this will be great, it will, it will bring you better business, they look at Microsoft and they'll go, my investors don't believe it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I think that there's a, there's a certain degree to that that's true. I think it's also a certain degree that it's like their whole apparatus, their whole go-to-market apparatus is built around a very different model. So they kind of reasonably say like, well, our customers aren't asking for it. It's like, yeah, your customers aren't asking for it because you're talking to your existing customers. Like you are self-selecting for those people who are willing to build around a proprietary model. And also like, I mean, like, no offense to Lattice, but why would anyone be a Lattice customer if not for, I mean, certainly like there was no way we would be using Lattice if it were not for the bitstream having been reverse engineered and being able to use open source tooling on it. Like I, why else would I want to camp out on like the fourth place FPGA vendor? I mean the, uh, um, so for us, it's all about it being open and it's, again, it's kind of helpful for them to hear from us, but they definitely view us as just like bonkers. Um, I mean, that's, which is fine. I mean, that's uh, how, that's how most of the industry views us. So we're definitely used to it. Thank you very much. Yeah, you bet. Great question. Obviously it's something that is definitely near and dear to my heart. And yeah, you and I definitely share a worldview on it. Yeah, cool. Uh, we have another uh, request, Vint. Hey, Brian. Um, hey, Dennis. Thanks for letting me ask sort of a dumb question here. Um, I think one of the things that I, I keep hearing about is this uh, microchip shortage and I'm way on the software side. So it's sort of not really impacting my day to day uh, too much as a consumer, but even as a practitioner uh, on the database side, even. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, you're in the, <laughs> the hardware business and I'm wondering if you're seeing some impact or is this. Oh, God, yes. That? Yeah, oh, it's, oh okay. God, yes. Oh, God. Bullets and, whizzing oh, here, let me, over the years. Okay, so and I'll, I just wanted to check because I didn't know if it was a thing, but then I to relate it back to the subject, is this is the change in the hardware environment, like production environment, going to have any impact on software, or is this kind of just transitory in your mind? Well, yeah, great question. And so first of all, it is very, very real. I mean, it is extraordinarily real uh we have been able to avoid deeply material impact i am knocking on wood um we have been able to avoid deeply material impact only because we've been saved by two factors one uh in our first years uh you know as we, as we go to build our first production rack next year we're just not to 
the quantity that would be delib- debilitating. So it's like if you were looking for hundreds or thousands of, it's a lot easier than tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of a thing. So we've been saved by that. We've been we've been profoundly saved by my colleagues at Oxide. We have added to the team some terrific folks from the from the supply side, from the supply chain side. Uh, we added folks coming in from Apple, um, from GE, other places that that are very cognizant of those issues and indeed when we um we added i i our kate hicks to the team last year she came in from apple the very first thing that kate said is we need to focus on long lead time parts and i think that and you know i, I saw adam has been kind of kicking in and out of here but the you know I, I remember my reaction being like kate we don't know what we're building yet <laughs> like and this is before the great kind of supply chain shortage he was very very good about getting us to focus on those long lead time parts and um, and it, it saved us, absolutely saved us. So the thing is very, very real. I think that it is, um, you know, I don't completely understand all of the factors. I think that, you know, that this is where things do get a bit shady um, to understand all of the factors. From You have to understand from these components, from the component manufacturer's perspective, they see boom and bust. They They have seen gluts in the past. They are very concerned about gluts. Um, so they are very concerned about ramping up new production lines and then set, trying to sell into a glut. There is no question that there's been panic buying going on. I mean, we've engaged in panic buying. So I know that like uh, people have definitely engaged in panic buying. And by, by panic buying, I mean, you see a part come available where there's a thousand of a quantity, a thousand of a thing. And the and you're thinking to yourself, I'm not actually sure if I want to use this part, but the part itself is pretty cheap. And I know it's really hard to get and it's potentially essential. So I'm just going to buy them all. Um, and we've done that a couple of times. Um, so I, I'm sure that that's happening writ large as well. In terms of how that's going to impact us broadly in software, because I think you've got a great question of like, all right, I hear about the supply chain shortage, but you know, from a software perspective, does this actually uh, does this have any any implications for me? I think one of the longer term implications is if you look at where the supply shortages have been most acute, it's with these older MCU microcontrollers on older process nodes um, that are relatively inexpensive, which is part of the problem, or were inexpensive. Um, I think that what you're going to see more and more software where those components were. So it's going to, it will make more sense to have, you know, if you've got, you know, a fan controller that you can no longer find, well, a fan controller is not that complicated and that can really be replaced with a Cortex M0 core, um, a, a general purpose Cortex M0 core or an, or potentially soft logic or an FPGA. So I think you're going to see, more and more software uh, where those components once were, and it's going to drive us more towards general purpose componentry much deeper in the stack as we get into the, the, these little these little doodads because it's the doodads that are that are are really tough. Now I think that like the it, it shouldn't be a surprise that with you know it's the older process nodes, older MCUs, and folks that are buying in quantity that are most impacted. It's not surprising that if you add all that up, like that's got the automotive industry right in the crosshairs, right? The automotive industry has all three of those problems: older MCUs um, that are they needed in you know they needed in massive quantities on older process nodes, and I think that that's where it's been really kind of crunched. And I don't know what's going to happen. In, in you know, I yeah, it would be it would be. Uh... Yeah. Like jump in there right quick. I think one of the things, at least with audio manufacturers, is that they've only verified the safety of like a couple SKUs or whatever, because that's what they like based on like the, you know, Hacker News articles or whatever I read every once in a while. It's like, yeah, those MCUs are the ones that they can use because that's what they've spent 10 years verifying that it won't explode when you turn the steering wheel the wrong way five times or whatever, right? Like, <laughs> Yeah. No, I think that's that's exactly right. And, you know, I think it's like that argument has got a lot of weight, but it's also easy to give it too much weight in that they, you know, you can totally understand the bias towards not wanting to dork with an extant design. Like we know this design works. Not that a new design would be like by its design unsafe. It's not that a new MCU would be unsafe. It's just that we don't know, we actually don't know our systems necessarily well enough to know 
uh, what we don't know. And we can't actually nimbly move to a, a newer architecture. And then also a lot of these systems are in, in C and C++. I mean, they're, they're all, and, you know, where, and certainly having spent the last, you know, now two years doing embedded Rust development, uh, I mean, it is borderline malpractice, I think, at this point to contemplate embedded development and anything that's not Rust. Be, I, I cannot imagine C. But then when I think about it, I'm like, well, okay, actually now I can't imagine why so many of these things get tied into this galactic knot where they can't move it forward. Because, I mean, so if, if you're using an MCU in which there is no memory protection, I mean, that's an environment where obviously you can develop a C-based system for that. That's going to require a lot of discipline because it's really easy to be like, hey, I'm going to take every device – I'm going to map it into this one address space that I've got. And by the way, I'm using a language that can do whatever the hell it wants, whenever the hell it wants. So, um, yeah, we're going to get a system that, and then we're going to beat the system into submission until it works. It's like, yeah, you're really uncomfortable moving to a new MCU that's got, you know, a different memory map or that's got a different set of devices or what have you, because you don't actually understand how much you've tied your system into a knot. So I think that that's part of it as well. And I do think that we are, you know, asking again that question of like, how much does this impact software? I do think that we need better abstractions at the lowest layer of the stack. We need, uh, in these embedded systems, we need to get them out of the world of writing them in C. We need to, we need to emphatically, and this is, I should not have to say this in the year of our Lord 2021, but Jesus Christ, we need memory protection in these systems. I'm not saying that automotive systems don't have memory protection, um, but it's shocking to me how many embedded systems don't actually employ memory protection in the hardware. Um, and uh, galling. Um, and, you know, we're, I, I'm, again, I'm talking my book a little bit here. We're right on the cusp of um, open sourcing our system that we've developed. We've built an all Rust operating system that we call Hubris, appropriately enough, um, the, that, that very much employs memory protection, microkernel-based system. Uh, and my colleague Cliff Biffle is giving a talk on that at the Open Source Firmware Conference in just like 10 days. Uh, and we're going to open source it ahead of that. So um, people will get a chance to see what we've done in that regard. I don't think we're going to be the last system in this regard. I think there are going to be more of them. And I think BlueStack and Rust add up to part of the way that software can help us uh, not have these intricate supply chain dependencies by having more general purpose components or spots and more places where we don't have implicit dependencies on a 15 year old MCU, which is what's killing the automotive industry right now. So, and this will be my last question because this is super interesting. I, you know, don't have the vantage to see this stuff and whatnot, but I guess, you know, uh, everybody can see that the market's going to crash or whatever. But you know, where it can remain a logical. <laughs> oh God, that. yeah, yeah, so definitely that, true. It's that question of timing. Like when, when do you think? Like I agree with everything you just said. Yeah. When's it happen? Oh, that's a great question. And as I have long since learned about myself, maybe in the market crashes that I have seen in my life, uh, the um, I am frequently right on trajectory and like virtually always wrong on timing. So. I, I do not know on timing. I think that with all of these things, um, part of the reason that timing is so hard to predict is because it's really dynamic. I mean, you can view it like, you, you can view the conditions that allow a change to happen as like a dry forest, right? If you've got a, a forest that's got, you know, 10x the fuel load that it should have and is bone dry, you know that thing is an inferno waiting to happen. But it's really hard to predict when it will actually and will be a lightning strike. Will it be a downed power line? Will it be the spark from a chain? It's like, it, it, you know, and I, there's a reason that we use it metaphorically, but we don't know what is going to spark that. I feel the same with a lot of these changes where it's like you don't actually know what's going to spark it. It makes more sense looking at it in hindsight. And I do wonder, I mean, could the supply chain issues that we see now, could we view that in, you know, five and 10 years? Will we look back on that and say, wow, that really precipitated some pretty deep change? I don't know. Um, and it's, again, it's hard to speculate, but I do feel confident about the, about the trajectory. I just don't know about the time. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I was wondering if I'd catch you with a, 
I'll call you in one month and see what happens, type thing. But no, uh, I, I, I don't. And, and so one, the other thing I would say that I've learned about myself that is also kind of strange is that we seem to be getting closest on timing when I have total capitulation. When I begin to like, I'm like, well, God, fuck, maybe this change won't happen. You know, I and I definitely remember this most vividly with the dot com bubble. Where I was definitely like a, uh, I, I wouldn't say I was a naysayer or a malcontent, but I was definitely like skeptical of the doc. It de- the dot com bubble definitely seemed too good to be true. And I definitely remember having a moment where I'm like, well, you know what? Fuck it. Maybe it is actually just going to go on forever. Actually, you know, this is not a bubble. And I swear, like, the bubble burst like a month later. So, um, you know, maybe it's when I like give up on the change happening. That's when maybe you want to really look out for it. Um, but, uh, I mean, you know what? I'm not even going to take us there. Let's just say that there's some bubbles that are really waiting to burst that I feel are very overdue. And I'm just going to leave it at that. All right. Um, I will. I will just approve one more request uh, for a, a quick, quick question. Okay, uh, Omkar, uh, please go ahead. Yeah. So uh, I, I had a couple of questions, but I think I'm going to go for the second question because when you have talked about the need for uh, or better abstractions, so that that uh, clarified a lot of things. I'm curious to understand what are your views on uh, low code? What what sort of role do you see low code trend playing over here? Because there's two sides to this coin as well. There's pure consolidation of software processes with a vendor, where a vendor's performance could take effect at scale. Or are we just inheriting worse and worse abstractions with uh, low code? And so are you saying local or, or sorry, I, I I'm missing the word in there. The, uh, oh, so I'm talk- talking about low code. So oh, uh, low code. Oh, got yeah. it. Right. The, the, like the, 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 sorry. Um. Yeah, I. You know, I'm all for it. I guess. Like, I, I don't know. I'm all for. I'm all for low code. I'm all for so, like. The, I think I'll reiterate. My, my, yeah. Be a bit more clear. So yeah. There's 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 much more applications at scale being built on low code tech right now. And I see it going in two directions. One is consolidation of these software processes with vendors where, say, Airtable optimizes their processes and that just takes effect at scale. Uh, But on the other hand, there are these abstractions that are being uh, inherited everywhere. And we we could just be inheriting some really, really bad abstractions going back to the examples that you gave a few minutes before. So... Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Like, do you think uh, low code plays a better role in terms of software optimization or software performance optimization? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think it, it's going to kind of go. To, I mean, like, take the Airtable as, as as an interesting kind of example, where the you know I think that Airtable allows for more Airtable customers and definitely allows for uh, broader programmatic access um you know it allows for people to be able to to do complicated queries or complicated things with with the kind of the minimal programmable programmable logic which is great but i think that it's a mistake I, i think that what that allows you to do is do things quickly and do new things quickly which is very important but as soon as those new things sediment into something that you know you're going to want to do repeatedly then the performance becomes actually much more important. And, and then, then, of course, in all of that, what becomes very important is the performance of the underlying platform. So the performance of Airtable itself, the performance of the actual thing, that becomes very important. And then you, the, the efficiency of that becomes very important because it's going to be driven by this yet higher layer of abstraction. So, I mean... It, it, I, I think it's like it makes sense to me. I mean, obviously, it's just like it's like Excel macros, right? Excel macros are great and they're really important. And so we, I, I don't really view this as like a new phenomenon, really. Um, I view this as a phenomenon that over and over again, where we, uh, we we allow people to phrase programmatic logic in something that doesn't really look like a program, and we give them that power of programmatic logic, which is super important. Um, but once we actually know that this is what we want to go do, we actually don't want to have this in a spreadsheet with a complicated macro. We actually want to begin to dope this to, we don't want to use a proper database for this. So we want to actually put, put this into a proper program, which gets to that inflection point that I talked about at the, at the top. 
I'm not sure if that answers the question. But... No, that does. That, that does. Yeah, that does give a good insight there. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, Dennis, I'm not sure. The, were oh, there any questions in the, in, the, in the Discord or? Sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I was talking on mute. <laughs> no worries. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, it's funny, you know, uh, the Twitter spaces is called so software performance. We're we talking about hardware, but that's fine. That's fine. Absolutely. Uh, and, and Brian, you know, at the risk of starting another rant, <laughs> uh, <laughs> let me let me ask this question. So, you know, the uh, general purpose CPU market is dominated by the uh, super scalar architecture, right? So do you think that uh, we, you know, uh, Anyone can beat super scalers in terms of performance. And let, let, let me sort of you know, define this question better, right? Because so here I'm I'm only talking about the general purpose workloads, not the ones that are you know massively parallel. It's just you know single thread performance, if you will, right? Uh, and and let's also for a minute set aside the power and money constraints, right? And, and you mean super scalar in its in its technical definition? You mean a super scalar a a, a a pipeline that executes in parallel effectively? Yeah, pipeline yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yes, like we that is necessary but not sufficient. Um, so I think that the I, no, I don't see anything really displacing that, especially as we. I mean, I, and clearly we've hit a a kind of a sweet spot on how deep you want those pipelines to be. Um, how, I mean, famously, as we saw with Spectre and Meltdown, how uh, the, some of the costs of, of speculation and of over-optimizing for single-thread performance. So I think we can expect some kind of balance there. But I also, it, that does not return us to naive cores. Um, that does not return us to, you know, I, I don't see Risk Five displacing x86 or the or the or the ARM kind of the graviton class parts um, in oh, server yeah, side computing anytime soon. Sorry, Brian. Yeah, so so I, I like I didn't mean about you know ISAs, right? So I'm not talking about ARM versus you know x86 versus Risk Five. I'm I'm talking about the you know the CPU like architecture, right? So like uh, you know, so I, I I'll just give you you know a few few um, a few startups I I actually heard about like recently. Um, it's like you know, uh, there is mill architecture, right? So they're doing the, like VLIW design. There is also like recently a uh, uh, startup called Asenium. I'm I'm not sure if you have uh, you know heard about that, but so they're they're doing some kind of you know hybrid sort of you know GP, uh, FPGA and general purpose CPU approach. There is still you know a lot uh, uh, not, not not much public public information about them. So. Um, so, you yeah, know, I mean, uh, is, so the, the, the problem is with the ISAs, because the ISAs are not open, it ultimately does implicitly come down to an ISA question. I know you're not asking an ISA question, but like VOIW is that, that that's an ISA issue. And VOIW is a is def, is not a new idea. It's it's it has been, you know, around and Mill is not a new company. Um, they, I think um, the, the, the problem with all those approaches is they tried to take. Um, an ISA, a strictly ISA approach to a microarchitectural problem, and they're just not able to beat. Uh, and when I say x86, I mean AMD and Intel, in part because not because there's like, not because of you know, um, because of ASCII adjust for add or whatever the uh, or or ASCII adjust for multiply, um, or all the kind of the super weird instructions that x86 has. It's like that's got, there's nothing endemic to x86. Um, although I, I think actually there's a little bit of an asterisk on that because I actually do think the code density of x86 is actually quite good and that actually does end up being pretty important. Um, but I, th I think that it's, it is all about the, the, what AMD and Intel were able to drive economically. And it's like you, you look at these other CPU startups and historically they've not really been able to compete with that because they're trying to basically compete with the same kind of model i mean to me the most interesting cpu company out there by far is cerebrus with the the disclosure that that we share an investor um so that you know um that they're a sibling company in that regard but cerebrus is actually taking a really interesting approach with wafer level silicon they've solved a bunch of really interesting problems and 
that to me is is way more interesting than kind of uh, positing about changes in ISA that would require really an implementation behind them in order to be able to validate. And what Cerebrus has, Cerebrus is a very implementation heavy company. What they're doing is not necessarily, a, it's not an abstraction, it's not a new ISA necessarily, although that too, but it, it is more about solving really gnarly implementation problems. And that that is, the CPU, by the way, is really gnarly implementation problems. Implementation problems so gnarly that Intel has lost its lead to AMD over process and implementation. I mean, that is, uh, and I think we can all agree that Intel has been pretty good historically on process and implementation, and yet that is the battleground on which they have lost to AMD. So this is, this stuff is really, really important, much more important than, I think, than the ISA. Um, then, I mean, VLIW doesn't buy you nearly enough on, you can't have a naive implementation of VLIW and compete with a modern CPU. You can't have a, so I, I don't see something like a mill ever meaningfully. And we see the same thing with computing, by the way. Um, there have been a bunch of these kind of sideshows, honestly, that seem kind of like promising in the abstract, but when you actually get down to the details, can't meaningfully compete with these general purpose CPUs, which are, by the way, are really, really hard to go compete with because they've got a lot of resources, a lot of very expensive process, a lot of very expensive validation. So, you know, if we like set aside the economics for, for, for a minute, right? And yeah. then so, so you know, so <laughs> motivating examples for like, you know, uh, where, where super scalers, you know, are lacking uh, is that, you know, uh, Consider you have this, uh, you know, uh, uh, like a, you're calling foo and then you're calling bar. Those foo and bar, they operate on, you know, on the different set of data. So, so they can theoretically run in parallel, right? But right now in superscalar, you know, superscalar is limited by the, you know, this out of order window, right? That it, it can see. So it will execute foo and only then it will execute bar, right? So if we, you know, can uh, I, uh, statically that's definitely schedule... Not true. I mean, that's not, that's definitely not true, right? So the, I mean, Spectre and Meltdown should kind of reveal to the world how not true that is. Um, and again, you know, the uh, bar will begin executing long before Foo completes. That's what speculative execution is. Well, it, it only if Foo is small enough. If Foo, if Foo is, you know, is, 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 you know, a giant, a giant, you know, a piece of code, then, then, you know, in, if it in the, in the super scalar, you know, out of order window, then it will then then the bar will execute you know uh, I, I mean only it, only at the beginning of uh, oh, I'm sorry at, only at the end of foo right so but, I, I mean you, you need to get down to kind of like uh, to like real details but again Spectre is speculative is speculative execution of, uh, across and meltdown especially speculative execution across a protection boundary so it tells you how I mean, the CPU is way far ahead of where you think it is. Sure, sure. That, that's true. That's true. Yeah. But it's important because it's like, it, 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 and I think it, it, you know, speculative execution was actually really essential for the rise of Intel. Part of the reason that Intel bested every other CPU vendor is because they got very good and very aggressive at speculative execution. That's how they got around the memory wall. So to me, it is really, and actually John Masters, we had John Masters on our podcast uh, when we first kicked off our On the Metal podcast. And as, so I was asking John the question of like, Where's the stuff written down? I mean, it's obviously not in any of the architecture manuals for any because this is truly the secret sauce. We see it revealed when we actually have a vulnerability, and then you see like, oh my God, this thing is speculating much more rampantly than we thought it was. How can we? So I, I mean, I think your question is at some level unanswerable, or you have to answer it very experimentally with just how far will the CPU speculate ahead, and just how many right. different. Different paths. CPU goes down a lot of different paths that don't end up going anywhere, and sure. it, 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 you know, it is designed to kind of minimize those over time. But the, the, really, the place you need to go is their patent applications to figure out what they've done um, around speculative execution. So I, I think, it, it, and those it, that ends up being very germane because when people look at kind of these ISA improvements or these kind of surface improvements, or they talk about super scalar as if that is what a CPU looks like, you're missing 
all of these implementation details that actually are very germane and it, it's very tied into the economics. I know you said like disregarding the economics for a second, <laughs> but you, you you can't disregard the. I mean, if anything, like that is I feel like the the, the deepest lesson that I've learned in twenty is that you can't actually disregard the economics because the what we are ultimately doing in software is an economic expression, and the th those economics will shift and change over time. But we, we we need to be very careful about disregarding the economics because they're so essential to the endeavor. All right. Super scalers will stay. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, okay. sorry. Yeah, I don't mean to sound like I'm a super scaler dead ender, but uh, it's very hard to go compete with. Put it that way. I, 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 well, I mean, I, I, I definitely agree with that. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so Brian, you also recently gave a talk, uh, you know, about hardware and software co-design, and and there is one thing again I I am particularly interested in. You know, to me it seems that the industry in the uh, is a little bit diverged here, right? You know, we have Apple which tries to own the entire hardware and software stack. And we have many other, <clears throat> you know, um, many others who work on, uh, on, you know, on the independent different pieces of the whole platform, right? On motherboards and CPUs and, you know, and, 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 on, on memory and uh, stuff like that. So do you think, well, well uh, how, how do you see the future of hardware and software co-design? Co yeah, so I think the future is hardware software code design. I mean, I feel that very, very strongly. And I think that if you look at, I mean, look at the success of M1. I mean, there's, you know, where people have got a cheap, fast, cool, long-lived, uh, from a battery life, uh, CPU. And it's, this is delivering much better results to the end user. Results that are so much, so much better that they're able to use, I mean, this is, I mean, admittedly, the Apple has used binary translation successfully in the past. So basically, the I mean, one of very few companies to really successfully use binary translation. But they're, they've basically been able to use binary translation remarkably well. Um, I, so I think the future absolutely is hardware software co-design. Where I really diverge from Apple and from and from the, the the corpse of Steve Jobs, which still apparently runs the place, is that the secrecy is actually and and remaining proprietary is actually antithetical to that. And I, so I, I believe that the future is both hardware software co-design and open. Um, so Apple got it, I think, half right with the hardware software co-design and they're using it to deliver uh, terrific products. But I think that, that that future also needs to be open and Apple would actually lower its costs of development of this stuff um, if they would be an advocate for real open systems. And, and th that open hardware software integration, open FPGAs, um, ideally, open ASICs and, and I mean, oh, the opening up all of these processes all the way down open EDA um, is really essential to allow hardware software co-design to affect the revolution that we know it can. And again, that M1 is a very, very tangible example, I think, of many others, but that one is, is very tangible and current. Right, right. So, yeah, so, 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 you know, so to me, it seems that when you, when you like, like when you when you own the entire hardware and software stack, and when you close it, and you when you build the walls around it, you are essentially like limiting you know your innovations, right? It's only you who innovate now. But uh, when you open the ecosystem, right, you 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 know you, you also invite all the other innovations con and contributions from other from others, right? So that's you know I think the important piece uh, that we should not you know. Um, Right? Yeah, I, I see what you're saying, and, I, and certainly that's been the kind of the, the the history. I mean, I thought it was um it, it was very kind of funny to read. Rod Canyon wrote. A, Rod Canyon was the CEO, founder CEO of, of Compaq, and when he wrote the history, his history of Compaq, the title he chose for that was Open, which I was like, what? I mean, that's just not Open is not the first word that comes to mind when I think of Compaq. Put it that way. Um, but it was. It, he did think of it that way. Um, and I think that this is where you do get to what you're describing, where developing some of these horizontal abstractions becomes really essential to unlock innovation from different areas on top of it, which is great. Mm -hmm. the, the problem is that you end up with the, when those abstractions, I think, when those abstractions are too deep in the stack, the innovation that you unlock is fleeting and the burden of that abstraction becomes permanent. So, I mean, I would... 
uh, with the risk of offending one of our listeners here, I, I think that, that UEFI is problematic in this regard, right? UEFI, you know, is, has served an important role, but UEFI ultimately shackles things that doesn't actually, it doesn't liberate innovation, it shackles us to implementation details. And so I think that's where we need to be very mindful of understanding where are the right abstractions to unlock innovation and what are the abstractions that we actually need to blow up to actually build a much more efficient system. And it's this kind of fundamental tension between the power of abstraction to develop new things and the cost, the burden of that abstraction, which actually prevents us from doing new things. And there's not a pat answer to that. The, the, the answer fluctuates and varies as you go up and down the stack and people have different opinions on that. And I would say our opinion at Oxal is more like the opinion at Apple, where it's like, actually, the innovation that I'm going to unlock is by delivering a much better artifact by actually co-designing the hardware and software. So I actually don't want this divide between hardware and software. I don't want to be able to run an arbitrary thing on this. I want to be able to run the thing that I am developing, the stuff I am developing that corresponds to the hardware that I'm developing with the belief that that gets me to a bet the abstraction where innovation, I think, really happens, which right now is further up the than that hardware software interface. Right now, that abstraction is happening with the software that we're developing on top of dynamic infrastructure, API-driven infrastructure. And that is, at least on the server side, that's the innovation that you want to unlock. And again, I'm obviously talking our book here. Um, that's very much Oxide's thesis, but we, I, I think it's a mistake. And I think that we have overly enshrined these levels of abstraction way down in the stack that have become really problematic and have actually prevented us from delivering better products. Okay, cool. Uh, we have one request from the audience. James, uh, go ahead. Yes. So, Brian, I was I wanted to ask, what is your opinion on like the rise of things like um, WebAssembly, you know, with use it used with uh, server side Rust and stuff like that? Yeah, I think it's really interesting. I mean, I, I don't actually and WebAssembly, I think, could be one of those things that uh, ends up serving a utility far beyond its name. Um, I WebAssembly might not just be for for the web. Um, I, I think that there are uh, certainly we have looked at WebAssembly for some use cases that are far uh, far afield from the web. Um, so no, I think WebAssembly is really interesting, and I think it's you know it's again where at that layer of the stack you really do want maximum programmability, and you're willing to absorb some hit from the abstraction, and WebAssembly especially when coupled with things like server-side Rust, arguably allows us to, to kind of square that and to have uh, really powerful abstractions that also potentially perform pretty quickly. So, I mean, I would, I would look to others for sure, but my attitude is like, hey, pretty interesting. I want to definitely keep an eye on it. And it feels like a really interesting development that will allow us to get, um, I mean, certainly it, it, JavaScript has been very important, but also very confining um, and allowing us to get out. For, and they, I mean, in some regards, I think the most, I don't know if it's unheralded or unsung or not, but I think like TypeScript is actually a really important innovation because TypeScript allowed us to get uh, modern programming. Uh, JavaScript just feels so like, God, I mean, I, I, I get you want to be dynamic, but Jesus Christ, do we have to allow so many foot guns? Um, and it's really frustrating to have a production issue that boils down to like a typo. Um, you're like, wow, it really would have been nice if something could have checked this. And obviously TypeScript is a huge, uh, a, a huge advantage in that regard. Um, I think that getting to a substrate that allows us to have, uh, to have much more strongly typed languages um, serving up those workloads, I think it strikes me as a huge win and pretty interesting to pay attention to. But I'd love to get James. I'd love to get your your thoughts on it. I, I don't know. It's that. How does that uh, comport with your thoughts on it? Definitely, one hundred percent. And you know, it, and back to you know what you were saying earlier about like um, the blending of software and hardware. You know, I think as as we move towards the edge and, you know, IOT and stuff like that become bigger and more popular, you know, I think it's almost a necessity that there's this working together of 
hardware and software is in. It's really interesting. And, and I, I find it also interesting what you all are doing at Oxide. And I uh, wanted to get your take on a, on a WebAssembly on that topic. Well, yeah, and I think it's actually interesting to mention like web, WebAssembly with respect to edge computing, which is not, I, I mean, I would dare say that's not the original kind of thinking around WebAssembly, but a good, yeah. another concrete example, but I, I think you and I see the same thing of like, wow, this could be useful in a bunch of different domains. And mm -hmm. I do, you know, I'm brought up IoT because that, you know, that's another example of something that I think is really important. And we, I know we got kind of, it's another thing that kind of got over at skis a couple of years ago. Um, but I think we are going to see more compute in more places and more confined means with that more compute in more places and more programmability in more places, we're going to need more people to be able to write correct code in those places. And yeah, WebAssembly. That's a pretty interesting idea. WebAssembly as a vector for IoT is is um, that's the I, I, I that's the kind of thing that I think you one would want to pay attention to um, because I, I think that that is going to be I, I just see us as we go forward with like how are we going to spend this bounty of ubiquitous compute and and what are the big problems that we face and I think one of the big problems that we face collectively is as we have always faced. How do we do more with the scarce resources that we've got? And to me, IoT plays a role in that. And so you kind of back mm -hmm. that up to the programmability. And yeah, a web assembly and IoT. Um, that, that's interesting to me. Definitely. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, you bet. A, a great question. All right, let me switch gears a little bit. And let's, uh, so I actually want to talk about, start talking about the oxide, but let me, you know, quickly touch on the topics of uh, of tooling okay and i know brian you are you're like observability a lot so let me just you know <laughs> ask if you have any sort of you know comments about what is the current state of the tools today like are you satisfied you know with all the like tools that we that allow us to analyze performance like are, are you satisfied with you know with compilers and and uh, you know uh, I mean, I, I, are they getting better I think, I think things have gotten a lot better, but I think there's, there's a long way to go. And I think that it's, um, there are, um, you know, a lot of challenges. And honestly, the, 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 one of the challenges that observability has always had is how, how do you plan for it? Because, you know, people, the, the, one of the kind of strange paradoxes is the parts of the system that we think about the most are, in my experience, the least likely to have debil debilitating performance problems. It's the parts of the system that we don't really think about or that we implement casually that w that's where some of the biggest performance problems lie. And honestly, those parts are, because we're thinking about them less, we're much less likely to think about the observability infrastructure. So I think one of the challenges that observability infrastructure has always had is how do I allow us, how do we allow ourselves to find those things that we didn't think about when we were implementing them and that we didn't think could be a performance issue. How do we allow ourselves to find those things quickly? And I think we're still working on that. You know, I think we've got, there's a lot of great stuff that's out there, a lot of great stuff that's happening. I've been, I think, pretty much delighted by the fact that observability is like a thing. Um, I think that, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't know who was using software observability before I was as a term. Like, I don't got it from somebody. Maybe I did. I don't know. Um, but when I started talking about software observability in, in the early 2000s, I was really trying to find – I was trying to find a highfalutin way to talk about D-Trace, honestly. Um, and, uh, and trying to, to – to, as we were trying to explain – because we definitely didn't ask for permission for D-Trace, but we did need to – I wouldn't say ask for forgiveness, but we needed to explain <laughs> – to an executive what we had done and why the problem was important. And observability was the term that I, that I used for that. Um, and again, I'm, I, I, I got it from anywhere, but I don't, but maybe I did, I don't know. Um, but certainly I, we were using observability a lot uh, long before other people viewed it as a thing. And it's great to me that now it, 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 that it kind of became a thing and now it's O11Y or whatever. It's like, oh, that's great. I'm really glad that people are thinking about observability. Um, I would like people to think about debugability as much as they think about observability. Observability and debugability are often the same thing. Um, so maybe we can get, maybe debugability can start trending too, um, whatever that is, D, what is it, D13Y, I don't even know. Um, you need to, need to spell it out. Um, but um, I, I think it's great that more people are thinking about it. I think it's great that there's more energy behind it. I think it's great that people are taking different approaches. And no, I definitely don't think that we are all the way there 
for all in, in many regards, many, 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 many regards. I mean, there's so many basic things that we still can't answer. Um, and as the as the as the economics also shift, as the constraints shift, um, I think those shifting constraints require us with tooling to stay ahead of it. Um, and you know, part of my belief just has always been that we really need to invest in tooling first. Um, I have come to realize that this is not as con this is just not that widespread. Apparently, I don't know. I, I, I uh, to me, this is so deep in my DNA that before we would, of course, before we would improve something, we would understand what the hell it's doing. <laughs> like, are we just gonna sit here and guess about it? Like, don't we want to understand what it's doing? So, as a result, to me, like debuggability and very core to who I am, and it, I don't when uh, to build de debugging tooling, debugging infrastructure ahead of the software we're building. But I don't think that that's, a, sadly, I, I think that should be broadly held, but it's not broadly held. So I think in, in certain regards, observability has that same problem because observability is debuggability. Observability has the same problem of how do we build that ahead of our software instead of behind it. Um, and that's, that's a real challenge. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, w one quick question. Uh, on the compilers and, and LLVM, for example, like you know, I, <laughs> I I recently talked with you know with many compiler experts and 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 you know and sort of you see uh, so I I still I like I kind of see that they they think that uh, we face tail in terms of you know classic compiler optimizations, right? So you know uh, like those compilers they are they are already mature, right? So they they you know they do all the classical optimizations really well, and there is not much headroom there. Uh, do you have any, you know, thoughts on 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 that? Um, I mean, personally, I think that there's a lot of headroom. I think that the, one of the challenges with LLVM, I mean, LLVM is really interesting. I think, um, and the, I think it's a very important um, forward. LLVM in that step forward, just as that that same tension around abstraction. We see that same tension with LLVM, where the the abstraction that's kind of sliced through there can make it, I mean, so it, for example, with with Rust, we actually can do some really interesting things with memory disambiguation, which is a very hard problem to solve. Um, it's The memory aliasing problem is pretty brutal. Uh, with C, it's basically like not possible um, because anyone can do anything any, I, I, at any time. Um, with a language like Rust, you can actually take a really interesting swing at memory disambiguation. And that actually could, result, I think, in much better code generation, even though we're seeing now. And Rust, to be clear, has got like really uh, pretty good code generation from my perspective. I mean, it's I, I'm amazed at how many things, how, I mean, Rust prides itself on zero cost abstraction. And I'm amazed at how many times that ends up being true, where you see, and from someone doing debuggability infrastructure, this ends up being uh, confounding and challenging, but in good ways, where you have like a single instruction that represents going six frames deep. Like in that single instruction, you actually executed six frames, uh, six stack frames deep. Uh, from the programmer's perspective. And how do you convey to the programmer what happened on that single instruction? And that's assuming, I mean, also, the stuff can obviously be optimized out. It's like there are zero instructions that correspond to to that th those stack frames. Um, but, so I've been impressed, honestly, about the quality of code generation for LLVM. I, I love the kind of the model of having, uh, spending more time compiling code to get us uh, artifacts that run more efficiently. So I think there's a lot of room to run. Um, I'm not a compiler expert, so I would, I, I, but it wouldn't surprise me. You know, the experts often think that we're that there's nothing, nothing more to be done. But uh, the, I, I think there's a lot more to be done. And I think if you, you know, if one were to assume that the world, without the high performance world, were written in Rust, say, what could one go do, knowing because Rust constrains the programmer in really important ways. And those constraints can allow for a higher performing artifact. What can we go do on top of that? Again, not my domain of expertise, but I think it's a question that should be posed. Mm -hmm. Cool, thanks. Uh, question from the audience, uh, Daniel. Yeah, I, I would actually like to add something to the previous topic of WebAssembly, and that also implies tooling. So I'm working on an editor for firmware, but it's not just an editor, it's also a rich exploration tool. And I'm currently leveraging uh, the tools that we already have, which were written in Go, 
uh, but I might also add some written in Rust, which I can trivially just uh, compile to WebAssembly. And all I need to do is to just change the entry point basically from what we have in command line to something where I'm just passing something that we call, uh, well, it's sort of an array or array buffer. Uh, that's what we have in JavaScript. And then I can just use that in my web application. And I can run that perfectly on the web. I can just retrieve back something in JSON uh, and render it on the fly as I like, because it's very trivial in, uh, on the web to just visualize things because we have so many options for styling and a very rich ecom already. And so if you're interested in that, um, you can check out the Fietka application. That's on fietka.app, F-I-E-D-K-A dot app. And there will also be a talk on it at OSFC, which we just recorded yesterday. That is awesome. And if folks aren't following Daniel on Twitter, they should be. Daniel, you're one of my – there's uh, – I love uh, open firmware Twitter, open hardware Twitter. Um, and, yeah, I think that's a, that, that's a very interesting kind of concrete example of the, the, the power that we get by putting it in, in new and interesting places. That's really cool. And I, I can't, I'm looking to see talk. That'll be great. All right. Uh, so, so one last question before we switch to Oxide. So, um, uh, Brian, what do you think of uh, Fuchsia? This is in OS, I guess. Oh, Google, Fuchsia. as far as I know. Yeah, Fuchsia. So, uh, oh, Fuchsia. Okay. Sorry Fuchsia. But that. honestly, I actually the it is Fuchsia's got such. I didn't know how to spell fuchsia until fuchsia became a thing. Fuchsia's got a very weird spelling. I mean, English has got terrible orthography, <laughs> but fuchsia. So fuchsia is actually probably think of it because you won't misspell it. Um, yeah. Uh, so fuchsia is interesting. I, you know, I saw that question. I, so I, and I, I will tell you that my thoughts on fuchsia are probably overly colored by the number of former fuchsia engineers that we have at Oxide. Um, so there were a bunch of things that I didn't know about fuchsia that are kind of embarrassing to admit. But I actually somehow, I'm not sure how I got this idea. I thought fuchsia was, was, had a Rust kernel. Um, and it doesn't. It's got a C++ kernel. Um, and I kind of thought fuchsia was, was more of a Rust and then Rust plus kind of flutter, um, which is Dart system. And I, I really don't think that that's right. So there's... Um, there is rust in fuchsia for sure, um, but it is it is a long, long, long way from an all rust based system, and it looks pretty traditional. In a bunch of ways. I think it's interesting. I mean, I think that like I, I like look. I, I am in favor of any new system. I'm pro. I, I think that we we learn from one another. I think that. Uh, systems engage in experiments. Those experiments are important, and especially when they're open, the findings of those systems can be used by other systems. So I am very pro Fuchsia as well as I'm pro any other open source operating system. I think it's a big, interesting swing, but it is not kind of what I thought it was going to be. Um, so I, and I would let others that are much more qualified kind of kind of comment on that. But I think that you know I. I was shocked at the number of people working on Fuchsia, which I don't know. I thought there were like 20 people working on Fuchsia, um, and any Googler would probably be uh, be laughing at this because uh, that's off by well well more than an order of magnitude. There are there are there are lots and lots and lots and lots of people working on Fuchsia. So I think it just goes to show how little I understand it. Um, but. Uh, so I'm sorry, I don't have any kind of, uh, you're definitely not going to get me, I don't think, on a rant per se on, on Fuchsia. <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely pro Fuchsia, but I am not, so I, I don't use it. And it's, to me, I think if Fuchsia has the, the misfortune a little bit of like a new kernel in 2017 is like, oh man, you just missed because 2017 was kind of too early for Rust, just a little bit. Um, but there's no question in my mind that a new kernel in 2021 would absolutely be in Rust. There's just like zero question. Right? So you would not waste your time with C++ if you knew Rust. Well, cool. so I can also add something to that. Um, so Fuchsia, the, uh, which is supposed to be a capability-based system, um, is based on the Zircon kernel. Uh, which is written in C++, but there is also a work-in-progress port to Rust, which is called Zcore, if you want to look into that. Oh, interesting. Oh, there you go. Yes, I, I, so I'm not the only one who's drawn that same conclusion then. And is, Daniel, is, is Zcore open as well? Yeah, it is. It's, in fact, in development by the people uh, from China who are also working a lot on the RISC-V ecosystem. They have uh, one kernel, which is called our core, and Z core is like, okay, we can also uh, do another kernel based on the ideas from Fuchsia. Interesting. 
Yeah, cool. That's great. Well, and I think, and honestly, that I think goes to make the the broader and larger point about how important it is to have these open systems out there to to allow them allow people to say like, okay, here's what worked here, and I think the capability based system in Fuchsia is definitely is very interesting. It's probably the most interesting thing about the system. Um, the allow people to kind of take that and explore it with different implementation details, I think, is very important. All right, let's start talking about Oxide. Uh, so there is a famous quote, uh, software will eat the world, right? And yet, Brian, uh, two years ago, you started a, a hardware company, uh, not a software company. <laughs> so what opportunity you saw there? All right, well, Tennis, I'm, I'm going to see your famous quote, and I'm going to raise you a more famous quote, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so that is a quote from Mark Andreessen that you're quoting from his 2011 essay, yeah. Software's in the World. Uh, I actually prefer the quote from Alan Kay, which says the, the the people that are really serious about software do their own hardware. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go with that quote. Um, and uh, uh, Mark Andreessen, venture capitalist, Alan Kay, uh, Turing Award at ACM Systems, so software award winner. So I'm going to go with that, even though I, uh, I'm going to go with Alan Kay on this one. Um, yeah, so I mean, we, um, and of course, the actually, the, the intriguing piece the software's eating the world piece kind of merits its own reread um, because I think it actually, sh the problem with that piece actually, just to pick on it for a second here, is it is very software centric at the expense, and this is true for A16 as well, the, the venture capital firm is blind to hardware um, in part because of their own traumatic experiences with it. And Andreessen was on HPE's board when things were totally fucked up there. So they, I mean, they, they've got their own very sharp biases against hardware. And to a certain degree, I think they, they live in past of not really understanding this innovation across the hardware software interface at all. They only understand software. And if you look at the, you know, what are the companies that Andreessen cites in? It's like, you know, who does the future belong to? According to Mark Andreessen, it belongs to Zynga and Groupon and Foursquare. It's like, uh, okay, <laughs> can we go like, Let's, if we're going to revisit the essay in 2021, can we go revisit the companies in 2021? Because, like, as last time I checked, Zynga and Groupon and Foursquare are not ruling the planet. Um, and the, the, the companies that actually make much more lasting contributions are the ones that are doing hardware software co-design. So to me, it's like that essay has no mention of Apple, no mention of NVIDIA, no mention of it, it, companies that actually... Uh, have exploded in the last 10 years um, because they had a belief in hardware, uh, co-design hardware software innovation. So yeah, I, I don't agree. I, I obviously agree that software is important. Um, I, I disagree that software lives in a vacuum. I disagree that software should not be for, did not be designed with, with hardware, clearly. Um, and then I also, honestly, the core thesis of the company is that Jeff Bezos is not going to own and operate every computer on the planet, which doesn't sound controversial when you say it like that, but actually we live in a world that implicitly assumes that all of our compute, all of our server-side compute, will be public cloud compute. And we believe very strongly in the cloud, very strongly in elastic infrastructure, but I just don't, I think that there's going to be reasons for people to own their own computer. <laughs> and I think there are going to be people especially when you get to you know, a bunch of reasons for that, reasons around around uh, security, around risk management, around latency. Um, we talked about the edge earlier, um, but then also around economics. And you know, once you get large enough on the public cloud, it doesn't make sense to rent your compute anymore. You actually want to buy some. And right now, it, without Oxide, if you want to buy your own compute on the server, it's, it is Dell and it is HPE and it is Supermicro. Um, and uh, it is it, it is not fun to deploy infrastructure on that, um, having done that, having tried to live that, and having all of those abstractions cut against you, having all of those abstractions that have been sedimented through the PC revolution, through the dominance of Intel, thanks to things like speculative execution. We have these all these abstractions that are now really, really hard to deploy infrastructure at scale upon. And that's kind of the, the, the core thesis upon which Oxide is built is to blow that up, to take a vertical slice, hardware software co-design, and actually go rethink, yes, we love the silicon, we're not doing our own silicon, but everything on top of that, 
let's go rethink that and, and co-design it. So le let me briefly summarize uh, what you just said. So, so you, you uh, help people build their own clouds, right? So, so like, like essentially, like uh, someone says, like, I don't want to be dependent on Amazon. I want to have my own AWS uh, in, my, in my house, right? So sort of a decentralization kind of thing, right? Yes, and an AWS in your house seems unlikely unless you live in a data center. Um, I mean, you know, if you live in a data center, um, fine. But I think for most folks, it is not that I want iCloud in my house. I do feel a little bit like, and I, you know, cause people are like, I can't wait to have an oxide rack in my basement. Like, I don't think you're going to have an oxide rack in your basement unless you've got a lot of power coming into your house and a lot of spare cash. Um, because it's... You know, just like you're not going to have, I mean, if you, you don't have a rack of Dells in your house either or a rack of HPEs in your house. Um, so I, that's where we're really focused are on those folks. For, and I think our kind of initial from a go to market perspective, that, that first kind of tranche of folks, the folks that we have been working that are truly desperate for this are the ones that are doing this today. They're not contemplating doing it. They are doing it. They are today. Building out a building out elastic infrastructure on Dell and HPE and Supermicro, and they've got VMware, they've got Nutanix on top of it, and they are in excruciating pain. Um, and they there are lots of problems that they that they uh, want to see solved. And this is a market that has been the, the very existence of this market has been denied, um, and it's super frustrating to be a Dell customer. Um, having been a very large Dell customer, I can tell you it is not a fun experience um, because any problem that you have on Dell infrastructure, they've never seen. Like, you're the only, boy, we've never seen this problem. You're the only customer having this problem. And, like, you believe them the first couple of times a little bit. You're like, that doesn't seem exactly right. And they will blame anything in your surround for that problem. I mean, we had a problem... We had a, a, a parity error on our HBAs such that the HBAs would not start. The HBAs would, would reset well, when they came in at a, a clean power on state. They would stop with a parity error and they would need to be manually reset. Um, and the, uh, <laughs> they told us, not only are you the only one seeing this problem, not only have we never seen this problem before, but we believe it's due to the software load that you're running on this. And you're like, how the hell does that make sense? Like, well, how is it even germane? Like, it doesn't even matter. Like, this is, this is something that is failing in a way that it should never be failing. And don't you dare blame my software that's using this. Um, or at least if you're going to do that, like, do it cogently. Do it with something that's plausible. And this got so bad that I was actually at a conference where with this particular error in, and sadly, this is a, a talk that was not videoed, one of my very few that was not videoed, but I was at a conference in 2010, and I actually just asked the room, it's like, hey, you know, I know we got still have some people here deploying stuff on prem. How many people have seen this particular error out of this particular HBA? And uh, I was in a room of like maybe three or 400 people. And in that room, I would say maybe seven or eight hands went up, which is like from different people. And those hands that went up all started like looking at one another because they had all been told, you're the only one seeing this problem. And that seems like a comical example. And of course, like we all met afterwards and like, you know, got one another lathered up with, with rage at our shared rage at our vendor. That problem gets repeated over and over and over and over again. And I was like, wait a minute. I, I'm not the only one seeing this problem, but I am the only one with the technical sophistication to actually be able to meaningfully tell you the problem because the, what you are selling to are what you think you're selling to dentist's offices. You, you, you're, that's what Dell is geared to do. They don't understand a technically sophisticated customer. and But they have technically sophisticated customers. And those technically sophisticated customers are super frustrated with the product that they're getting. And then they're being told, so Dell tells them, like, uh, you're the only one seeing these problems, or we don't see the same problems that you see. The market tells them they don't exist at all. Um, and so as you can imagine, these, these customers, um, we found it pretty easy to generate some real oxide partisans because they are. Well, we had one of our first customers that we had uh, that we the VCs were doing reference calls with. Uh, they were like, uh, "Your customers are really animated." I'm like, "Yeah, they're pissed. Like they're pissed. They've been because and they're also spending a lot of money 
on HPE or and, and with 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 Dell and HPE, I think you end up with having higher expectations. Supermicro has the advantage of like you kind of know what you're getting, and Supermicro is very upfront about your what you're getting. Like, hi, we're Supermicro. We actually don't know how any of this works, and if you see any problem, instead of telling you that you're the only one seeing this problem. We're like, hey, can you like maybe we can work together to kind of figure out what this problem is, which is kind of refreshing to customers. I mean, Supermicro ends up at least being what it is, right? Um, but is also it, so that part is refreshing. What is frustrating is all the other parts about the Supermicro surround. Uh, they've got no software expertise whatsoever, and what you're getting is a personal computer. That's what you're buying from these companies. You are buying a PC circa 2000, and it is 2021, and we've got different problems. Um, and those are the so those are the problems that were that were those are the customers anyway that were that we're tacking into. Mm -hmm. So was it hard to raise a capital if you if you don't mind me asking? Uh, yeah, uh, it, I mean yes and no. So I mean like look, we raised one of the largest seed rounds in the history of Silicon Valley. Technically, it'd be a pre-seed round based on three jokers and and a deck a slide deck we raised 20 million bucks so i so like l l let me put any kind of complaints about vc in in perspective of we were able to raise we have great investors investors that believe in the company that that share our belief so ultimately yeah we were able to raise I wouldn't describe it as easy, and I definitely wouldn't describe it as easy. And I would also say that the, it, is, it, it is a slim uh, minority of VC that really see and appreciate hard technical problems. I mean, that is actually kind of a larger thing. It used to be, you know, 20 years ago, there were lots of startups solving hard technical problems, or there were more startups, I should say. I should say lots. I think that it's been it's been a long time since we had lots of, lots of companies solving hard technical problems. But the, the you had startups solving hard technical problems. It is uh, there are fewer today. VCs don't really understand it. They don't understand the advantage of it. They don't understand like it's hardware software co-design. I mean, the, you know, obviously. Firms like A16 have got very strong feelings about not having any hardware component at all. Firms like Eclipse, which is the firm that that uh, funded Oxide, you know, they almost uh, they kind of look at bewilder with bewilderment at that at that attitude because their view and actually was this first meeting was really great with Eclipse. It was very clear we were doing with a different kind of firm because Eclipse is like you know we just look at the most valuable companies that have ever been built. And of the most valuable companies that have ever been built, most of them have a hardware and a software component. So I, like, I think we could all argue that like, you know, companies like Tesla has a hardware software component. Amazon, hardware for Apple, hardware plus software. NVIDIA, hardware plus software. So mm -hmm. the, uh, it is kind of paradoxical that these VC firms don't see the value in it, but they don't. And they are, um, you know, VCs are, you know, I, I'm very grateful for venture capital, it has it, it has put literal food on my literal table. So I, I don't want to speak ill of VC as as an industry, but it ultimately has to be focused on how a company is resold, and it resold in a very tight time bounds. VC exit in ten going from first capital in to exit in ten years that is not long. And there are if you like, what are the companies that go from from first capital in to their apogee, to their, their maximum value in 10 years. Those companies are to last, they're built to flip. And they are, you know, those are your, those are your Boston markets, those are your blockbusters. Um, you know, I'm reading, uh, thanks to our Twitter space, and we had an interesting uh, Twitter space on, on books people have read. And in, in that uh, space, someone recommended Built to Fail on Blockbuster, and it is really interesting. Blockbuster is like a VC's dream because it is growth, 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 and not built to operate. And Blockbuster, as a result, did reach its apogee in about 10 years, a little less than 10 years, and then totally collapsed. And Viacom was left holding the bag. If you look at the comp Apple, Tesla, Microsoft, Amazon, 
when did they reach their apogee evaluation? Long, long, long after 10 years. And VCs are, so you need to find, and it's really hard because they're bound by the limits of their LPs and so on. But you need someone who can really take that much longer view when you're, I mean, we believe we're building a generational company. When you're building a generational company, a 10 year time horizon if, from first capital apogee of value is not nearly long enough. You actually need a lot longer time horizon. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, uh... Your product is a hardware product, right? And, and and all the software components are open sourced, correct? That's right. Yeah, hardware plus software. Yeah, we, we we view it as hardware, software, code design, and yes, all open source because uh, again, we've got like Lattice, we've got God's own open source revenue model. Namely, we sell the hardware, but the hardware has the software included. The the software is part of the hardware, part of the system. Right. Yeah, that makes sense to me. So uh, let me also ask this question. So. So, so Brian, you know, uh, I noticed that, that that you kind of have you know a small team, you know, migrating from one company to another company. <laughs> so let me let me ask you this one. So, uh, like, I mean, it, it is kind of surprising to me that you know you're you're still you know have the same kind of interests and you know you are not you know diverging. Uh, so how 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 do you engage other you know your friends and colleagues? Maybe they engage you. So how how do you you know manage that the relationship? Yeah, I mean, I am I am blessed by the the, the people. As you say, I've got uh, I definitely have a crew that I've worked with for a long period of time. But I've also got a crew that we've added to that crew in 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 really delightful ways. And uh, but I do believe I I am I am uh, I fiercely. Uh, uh, allegiant to our team and to what we're building and we're building it together and that is that is a and I think that's the way I've always believed in building things it's like we're we, the, the things we're building are so hard and so big that um, it takes a, a team a big team working hard to actually be able to solve these things but solving those problems is so gratifying you know, I think when you when you have a team pull together to do something hard, it's singular. You know, and I think that we we often lionize the past and think like, "Wow, I would have loved to be a part of you know the Apollo program." Right? I mean, what what technologist doesn't fantasize about playing a role in the Apollo program? The Apollo program took a long time, had tremendous failures en route. Um, and so if, if you're going to, if you believe, and I think people abuse this today, I, I, it drives me nuts when VC firms act, oh, we want moonshots. It's like, oh, you want moonshots? Okay. So can we have an Apollo history lesson? So what, what is the Apollo 1 equivalent that you're willing to fund? And in many ways, the most, you know, you know we think of Apollo when we think of the Apollo program. Everyone should think of Apollo 1. Apollo 1 is actually the most important thing in the Apollo program. That's the pad fire. And the uh, if you ever get the chance, and I you know I know he's spoken at various times on the record on various things, but I watched Gene Kranz deliver a keynote on this in 2013, and oh my God, his the way he speaks of Apollo One and the impact that that had. Uh, I mean, they took a two year hiatus after Apollo One because they realized they that everything was working by accident, and. They realized that the problems that affected that fire and cost the lives of, of their colleagues reflected deeper systemic issues of things that were working by accident. And, you know, that's the moment where and, you know, obviously there's a lot going on with the, you know, the Cold War and kind of unlimited funding and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the I feel like that's the moment that is the real test of a of, of a team. And I think if you come through those kind of moments as a team, people get the bond that you have with the people you work with is so strong. And, you know, I've got the good fortune of having people that obviously have done nothing near as significant as the Apollo program. But I, I have worked on hard problems. I have had equivalents of things that were really challenging, where which were deeply deep setbacks and the that. I got from my colleagues working with them through that was a very, very strong bond. And 
I would say the bond we're building at Oxide is even stronger. And I, I mean, much more so. Um, and, you know, this is going to be a crew that will uh, be bonded for life together based on the hard problem that we're solving together. And so what you're seeing is, I mean, it's true. They're like, yeah, you've got these, you know, these people that you've worked with from, from engagement to engagement. Yeah, it's definitely true. But what's actually happening is way, way, way deeper than you might realize or that we freak about. This is a beautiful answer. <laughs> well, well, Brian, uh, okay, well, before we let you go, uh, any books, uh, podcasts, or other recommendations, tell us, how do you educate yourself? So I got to say, I've really enjoyed, I, 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 I like Twitter spaces as a medium. Um, we have been, you know, we've been doing as, as you've been, we've been doing our kind of our own, I've been doing a weekly space with Adam, which has been a lot of fun. And, you know, we were kind of out of ideas one week and we're like, let's just do like books you've read recently. It felt like a total like punt, but man, that Twitter space was amazing. And I see, I, I know Cole Fredericks here. I've, I've seen Adam dropping in and out. The, uh, Cole did a great job pulling together the notes for that. And I'm still chewing through some of the recommendations from that where people were talking about books that they had read that, that were meaningful to them. Um, and I, so I would refer folks to the show notes on that one. Um, but there's so much good stuff. And actually, honestly, the, uh, to a certain degree, that got kicked off in our very first Twitter space when um, the Oxide uh, compensation came up. So at Oxide, we are just a... Just a spoiler alert at Oxide, everyone is paid the same. Um, we've got a blog entry that explains uh, the why and the how of that. Um, and we ended up talking about that. And someone made this extreme, what to me was totally new, um, describing that, that Jobs' next computer company did the same thing, actually. And, but it collapsed. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm now really interested to read that. And so I read Randall Strauss' Steve Jobs and the Next Big Thing, which it is so well written and so interesting. You know, Steve Jobs is someone we lionize when it's like, ah, the truth is a lot more complicated. Uh, this book is written when Steve Jobs is kind of being left for dead. This is before he returns to Apple. Next has been a disaster. It's very critical of him, but it, but in a way that's very balanced um, and very well reported. Great book. Um, and so that's, that's a recommendation that I got, you know, from a, you know, stranger on the internet effectively, but, um, that led us to all sorts of other really interesting books. So I, um, you know, and like I said, right now I'm, uh, the, the built to fail I just started from, uh, that, that came up in that podcast. I'm still, I feel chewing through, um, the, the list, I guess we'll talk about it again when I went out of uh, books to read, but, um, you know, I think that there's so much great stuff out there. I'm, I'm such a, I think, you know, in kind of the, in the era of scrolling, it can be easy to lose track of long form reading. Long form reading is really important. And I think we all need to read more and we all need to write more. And I, you know, I say this, this is, this is, this is Brian talking to Brian as much as anything else, because like I got, I, I forced myself to like, Hey, get off your phone or get off Hacker News for a second. If you read it, good, be done with it. Go read, you know, go, get, go read for a half an hour or an hour or an hour and a half. And I find that that time, you know, time that I spend on the internet is not necessarily, uh, doesn't necessarily leave me in the best mental state. I don't think I'm the only person who has this, you know, I, I, think, I think the the internet is great. One, yeah. I think uh, for, so like, I write so much that like it has become almost impossible for me to read for pleasure. Yeah, so I so I think that you, I think you should find that. I think the, the because there's so because well first of all reading makes you a better writer. Um and yeah. the oh, yeah. um I I think you know seeking out um and I I think you know kind of getting away from like the books of the moment. Um, I mean, the great thing about books is that, like, they don't disappear, and there's a lot of great stuff that gets kind of forgotten. I mean, certainly, you know, I, I know that I, it's this is a bit on brand to say, but, like, Tracy Kidder's Soul of a New Machine is so outstanding. If I have found, I found a book on meditation recently, 
that really just spoke to me and I've been really diving heavy into it. That's great. Well, and, I, and I think, you know, I think find that because I think that the great thing about when it's you and and a book and, you know, a drink and you're, you're sitting somewhere where you're kind of, you know, maybe you can get a, you can get away from the kids for a second or wherever it is. I just feel that like it just feels for me anyway. I mean, you mentioned kind of the, the meditation. It does feel meditative. I feel that like my, yeah. my, my brain not just relaxes, but but starts going in interesting directions. And you also see, I mean, I, OK, okay again, it's on brand for me. I think that history has so much to teach us. I, I, I do love history because I think so much of what we see has, I mean, the, the present very much rhymes with the past. And I think we've got so much to learn from the past. And there's so much that's there. There's so much meat on the bone, you know? I, and I find that even subjects that I think I know a lot about I find that I like actually am, there's whole new vistas that I, you know, I think I feel like I spent a lot, a decent amount of time with computing history, probably more than any other subdomain that I've kind of looked into. And I find that there are whole new vistas that I like. I, you know, reading this book um, by Severo Ornstein on the, and on his history and talking about the history of the link and Wes Clark. And I realized like, I don't know shit about the link. And it is actually, Wes Clark is a really interesting person. That's a really interesting computer. That was a really interesting team at a really interesting time. And I've been just like, wow, there's so much that I feel is current about that. And I feel that over and over and over again, I find that in in history that I, I, I just find things that are that are current. Again, there's so many lessons that can be can be and I, I feel that like the way to learn for me is to is to try to learn from the past. And I know I've again probably too on brand. I probably over rotate on it. I probably am too fixated on it. I definitely know I was too actually Dennis, you forgive me to tell you kind of a funny story about our raise. As you can imagine, I wanted to have a collection of every company that had tried to do anything approximating oxide and failed. Um, so we had an appendix slide on, on absolutely everybody on every obscure company. And one thing we did that actually, if anyone's looking to raise capital, uh, very, uh, or actually indeed giving, given any presentation that, that looks like a VC pitch, advice that was given to us by an angel investor in Oxide who was also happened to have been a venture capitalist for many years, um, but now is chosen to, he's now a VC conscientious objector. But uh, a piece of advice that he gave me that I thought was, a, was really interesting that we took to heart is, you know, in all of my years of being a venture capitalist, I, there's a technique that I only saw once, but it was extremely valuable and maybe have applicability here. And that is, instead of having a deck, you've got this, you know, 12 to 14 slide deck with lots of appendix slides. And if you have an appendix slide on something, when you scroll through your deck to get to the appendix slide, you're flashing a bunch of like, there's a bunch of, of shiny objects that you're flashing in front of the room that may not be, that are not answers to the question. And those shiny objects can lead you astray, can lead you to other questions that you don't necessarily want to deal with or want to, it, 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 it's not a sharp answer to the question. He's like, so what I would recommend doing, again, I only saw one firm do this, is have a, a, an index of all your appendix slides, know exactly what number to go to. And we're like, wow, that sounds like pretty goddamn good advice. So that's what we did. So we, and of course, it's like, it's, you know, because Jess and I are the ones doing this, of course, because it's us. We all made it, you know, we made it software driven so we could automatically generate our index from our Google slides, you know, hitting their API. Uh, and we had a printed index for every topic. And from a VC's perspective, it's as if we were reading their mind because they'd be like, Hey, wasn't there a company that did this like um, Blade Company? Um, I remember like Credit Suisse for Boston was involved. I'm like, Egenera? Yeah, Egenera. I'm like, Egenera, slide 112, Jess, go. And, you know, we'd flip to slide 112. And now there is like everything you could possibly imagine on this company. And 
on the one hand, I think I, again, I, I, I overshot the mark on this because we were so good at actually with that eGenera example, um, Peter Fenton at Benchmark, terrific investor. We were presenting to the Benchmark partners. Uh, they're a terrific firm. We thought the world of them. Peter Fenton was like physically ill, but really wanted to be in the meeting. So he was there and uh, obviously pre-COVID because this is, you know, not staying home with symptoms. And he asks about eGenera. We slap, flash that slide on eGenera. And I think like, oh man, we just nailed it with Peter Fenton. He's going to be so impressed. And he was impressed to a degree, but we were also flashing in front of him just how much money eGenera had spent and just how middling that outcome was. He's like, wow, they went through a lot of capital and like, wow. And I'm like, mm, maybe this was, maybe taking you into the graveyard was a mistake, actually. Uh, so I don't, I, who, who knows if it was or not, but um, the, I, I, I do feel that whenever one is, is going on an indebt, you don't want to be like held captive by history. It's like not an answer to your question, but you don't want to be incarcerated by history. But I do think it's important to be very cognizant of it because again, to learn from the mistakes and wisdom of others. Like you actually can, and I know that like, you know, startups are wasted on the young as you know, most 20 somethings are just not gonna, it's a real challenge for a 20 something to summon wisdom. And I say this as a former 20 something who had a very hard time summoning wisdom. Um, but uh, if you possibly can, there's a lot of wisdom to be gleaned from the past. And I would say that that guides a lot of my, of my reading. Well, awesome. Uh... Brian, it's been great talking to you today. Uh, well, I, I personally have so many insights. Uh, thank you for you know spending your uh, valuable time with us today. And uh, to every everyone, see you in uh, in two weeks. Dennis, thank you for having me. Awesome. Great questions, great crew. Really appreciate it. Um, and thanks again. All right. Thanks everyone. Thank, thank you. you. It was it was great.